Hey guys, welcome to AP Environmental Science with Mr. Jones. Today we're going to talk about how energy flows through ecosystems. So the lesson overview, the things that you should understand uh, by the end of the lesson are food webs and food chains, trophic levels, energy flow and the 10% rule, and primary productivity, which ultimately should allow you to understand how to characterize the feeding relationships and energy flow as you construct and look at trophic level food webs. So let's start by looking at food webs and food chains, which most of you are probably already familiar with. So we'll start at the bottom with grass, which is eaten by rabbits, and rabbits might be eaten by a snake. So <clears throat> this is a really simple food chain. Um, and most of you, like I said, have probably been looking at these for a while. Ecosystems are much more complex than that, though. Uh, so often, and this would be an example of a really simple food web, um, this is closer to what we might actually see uh, as we look at an ecosystem um, and the interactions between the species within it. It is, however, often helpful to look at these simple food chains in order to illustrate more complex topics. So trophic levels, uh, for example. And we'll add in one more trophic level uh, to look at, at this concept. So a trophic level is the group of organisms within an ecosystem that occupy the same level in the food chain. So, for example, we have primary producers. That's going to be all of the plants, the algae, at the base of the food chain. These are autotrophs. Um, they produce their own food through photosynthesis. Our primary consumers are the next trophic level. Um, and those are going to eat autotrophs. So these are our herbivores. Um, our example here is a rabbit. It could be the mouse. It could be deer. Uh, anything that eats plants is at that second level, the primary consumer. Secondary consumers are going to consume those primary consumers. So the snake that eats the rabbit uh, is an example of a secondary consumer. And similarly, tertiary consumers are that fourth level, um, and they're going to be uh, eating the secondary consumers. We have to remember that all of the energy uh, in these systems uh, is coming from the sun, with a few exceptions like hydrogen sulfide that's used in chemosynthesis um, and heat that's left over from the formation of the earth can provide a little bit of energy uh, to a system. But thanks to thermodynamics, most of the energy is coming from either the sun um, and with, again, a little bit from uh, chemical breakdown and uh, energy that's left over from the formation of the earth. Energy has to be transferred, right? We can't create energy. So it's transferred from one trophic level to the next. Um, and we'll start at the bottom, again, with primary producers. That energy is created through uh, the conversion, or it's not created, it's, it's converted from solar energy to chemical energy. Um, and that is the sugar that uh, we eat, the sugars and starches. Um, so the rabbit is going to get the its energy from the grass, the snake will get its energy from the rabbit, and the hawk will get its energy uh, from the snake. But only 1% of the energy that trans is transferred from the sun to the plant. So of all of the energy that's going to hit that grass, only 1% will actually be absorbed and turned into the sugars that are eaten by the rabbit. Uh, the rest is going to be reflected off um, or lost as heat. Similarly, only 10% will be transferred from one trophic level to the next. So from the grass to the rabbit, only 10% is maintained. Uh, and the same all the way up. And the rest of that energy is going to be lost as heat. It's a little dark. Another way to look at this is through these energy pyramids or biomass pyramids. So we can look at a system, in this case it's an aquatic system, um, aquatic marine system, and we could weigh 
all of the organisms at a certain trophic level um, for a given area. So in this case, uh, all of the phytoplankton makes up uh, 100,000 grams. All of the zooplankton is 10,000 grams, 1,000 grams at the third trophic level where there are fish, and then only 100 grams of sea anemone, which are actually going to be able to consume those fish. We're going to max out at around four or five trophic levels in almost all systems, um, and that's because there's a limited amount of energy that can make it all the way to the top. Primary productivity is where that energy, again, starts in the system. After the sun hits um, the grass, primary producers or any, any plant or algae, primary producers are going to use that energy um, through photosynthesis. Um, to produce energy. So primary productivity is the rate of conversion of solar energy to chemical energy. And again, that's gonna come through this process, photosynthesis. So if we look at the chemical equation for photosynthesis, we're gonna start with energy. And again, that's energy from the sun. We're also gonna need carbon dioxide, which comes from the atmosphere. And water, which is gonna come from uh, either the ground or in some cases it is also absorbed as water vapor from the atmosphere. But typically it's going to come from the roots or if it's an aquatic plant, obviously it'll come from its surroundings. That's then transformed through the process of photosynthesis into sugar uh, and oxygen. So the oxygen we breathe is coming from those plants. Uh, the sugar or starches that uh, those plants make are what's transferred up as chemical energy uh, through the system. All of the photosynthesis that occurs within a given area over a given time is what we call net primary productivity, or NPP. So the amount of sugar or starch produced in a given area uh, over a given time is what we would refer to as net primary productivity, which is great, but plants also go through this process of respiration, the same as you and I do. And respiration uh, we take that starch that's produced by photosynthesis uh, and combine that with oxygen to produce carbon dioxide, water, and more energy. That is energy that we can actually use. So the energy that's stored in the bonds of that sugar or starch uh, is released to do cellular work. So when we subtract the respiration that a plant does from the photosynthesis, we get gross primary productivity. Um, the units are the same, the amount of energy per area, per unit time, uh, and again, it's net primary productivity minus respiration. So energy is coming from the sun, and it's a limiting resource for primary productivity. So what that means is, as we move, as the earth moves around the sun, goes through its orbit, uh, we have seasonal variations because of the tilt of the Earth. Uh, so we're in the northern hemisphere here. Our summer um, is going to happen between March and September, where we have the majority of the sun uh, sunlight hits the northern hemisphere. In winter, the majority of the sun is hitting the southern hemisphere, and we get less. Our days are shorter. Um, and so because of that, we can actually map primary productivity on the earth as it changes with season. So this little GIF uh, is showing that. Where it's dark green uh, is where more primary productivity is happening, um, and where it's brown there's less primary productivity happening. Uh, and you can see it cycles from northern to southern, the northern to southern hemisphere uh, as the earth goes through the seasons. So that's energy flow through ecosystems, uh, and I hope that you found that helpful.